Hi, I'm Peter Kovacs. I'm the editor of The Advocate and the Times-Picayune, and welcome to our third virtual town hall um, today with Governor John Bell Edwards, who's here with us at the GOSEP headquarters Thank in Baton Peter. Rouge. Um, thank you for joining us, Governor. You're welcome. Um, we're going to um, start out with uh, the purpose of this town hall is for the governor to answer your questions that you've sent to us and will continue to send to us. We're going to start out with a little message from AARP, which is our sponsor today. Uh, and then I think the governor can tell us a little bit about what happened on the White House call, which he just walked in the room mm -hmm. from. And uh, then, we'll, uh, then we'll go with some of your questions. And at the end, um, Smiley Anders, who um, some, is so old that some people think he covered the pandemic in 1918. 1918 yeah. But he's actually not <laughs> 120 years old. He, he might look it, but he's not. Um, he has a couple of special questions for you about okay. some important topics like the chickens and yeah, the tiger. Smiley only asks about the important the stuff. Important I, look, stuff. I look forward to it. So anyhow, let's start out with a, a message from AARP. AARP Louisiana would like to thank the advocate for this timely and important conversation with Governor Edwards. We would also like to thank the governor for his leadership during this challenging time. I'm Denise Botcher, State Director for AARP Louisiana. AARP is a nonprofit, nonpartisan member organization that's been working for over 60 years to promote the health and well being of older Americans. Over the past month, AARP Louisiana has hosted several teletown halls with several thousands of its members to share important information, resources, how they can better protect themselves and their loved ones from the coronavirus. It's critically important that together we help prevent the spread. This is a time to remain vigilant and follow the governor's advice. Stay home, stay safe. Together, we'll get through this. Okay, well, we're, we're thanks to AARP, and we're glad to be here with the governor. And when I tell you that the governor literally walked in here one minute yeah. ago uh, off a phone call with the White House, that, that's about right. Yeah. And so maybe he can start by telling us uh, what you learned today. Well, the purpose of the call uh, was so that the president and the vice president, who leads the White House Coronavirus Task Force, uh, could talk to all the governors. And, and by the way, I've been doing this for a while now. There were 54 governors of the 55 states and territories uh, participating today, and that's that's the most ever. Um, and and this was about uh, the guidance that that they were issuing, uh, the, that the coronavirus task force was issuing out of the White House uh, to the states uh, about reopening uh, the economy. And the, the president made it very clear that these are guidelines, things to be considered but ultimately the decisions would be left to the governors and some governors uh, will be able to move faster than others because they quite frankly haven't had uh, the kind of cases that that some states have had unfortunately we're one of the hot spot states and we have been since the beginning uh, and and so we we have to take uh, stock of that uh, but but these these are uh, 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 guidelines that that Dr. Burks, Dr. Fauci, Dr. Robert Redfield have all had input into, and they give you things to consider. Uh, they phased it into three phases, and and this actually came out, Peter, while we were speaking. So I can't tell you that I've sat down and 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 really gone through this, uh, but I, my team is going through it right now to see how it meshes up with what we were already planning to do. Oh, one thing we know, and, and I want to say this at the outset because I think it's always appropriate and important to try to manage expectations. We are not going to get back to normal as a state or as a country until some time after a vaccine is successful, mass produced, uh, and used uh, across the country. Um, and so we're talking uh, at least a year and probably longer uh, before we can do that. In the meantime, we have to work on therapeutic treatments. We have to make sure that we open up our economy in a way that, that strikes the right balance by protecting uh, the public and, and, and ensuring the public health. Uh, and all these things are very difficult because this is a novel coronavirus and the, 
the scientists, the doctors, the medical community, learning new things every single day, which is actually a good thing. Because if we think we know for sure what the situation is going to be three months from now, six months from now, we're sort of kidding ourselves. Um, but these guidelines are going to be very helpful uh, as we move forward and, and reopen the economy here in Louisiana. Uh, it's, it's, again, not going to look like it did before uh, COVID-19. Uh, you know, I think you're going to see social distancing with us for quite some time, uh, emphasis on hygiene for quite some time. Uh, sick people are going to be asked at, to stay home uh, without exception. People who are vulnerable to this virus, so we're talking about those 65 and older and those who have these underlying chronic health conditions like hypertension, diabetes, heart disease, kidney disease, obesity, they're going to be uh, asked to, to make sure that they're especially careful. Um, and even as we loosen the restrictions, um, th th many things are going to stay in place and will look different. You know, for example, I I'm not announcing any new policy uh, just yet, but it may be the case, Peter, that, that when you do uh, finally go out to a restaurant, um, there won't be a table in close proximity to the table you're sitting at. Uh, your waitress or waiter may, may be wearing a mask um, and, and, you know, more and more often as you enter a building, you're liable to be temperature checked. And if you have a fever, uh, you'll be de denied admission. These are the sorts of things we're going to have to do as we open the economy uh, back up, uh, put more businesses back into operation and get uh, workers um, back at work. And the other thing we're going to have to do is continue to ramp up our testing and our contact tracing. Uh, and the testing is, is both the, the diagnostic and surve surveillance testing for the virus, but also the antibody testing for potential immunity, uh, all of which is very important. And as you test someone and, and they, they are positive for the virus, we're going to have to have much greater capacity to do contact tracing so that we isolate uh, individuals who have come into contact uh, with the individual who just tested positive. Much easier to say than to do because we're going to have to have trained uh, workers at call centers uh, who are going to have to, to do this. And then we're going to have to uh, have the cooperation of the people that they will actually isolate. The reason South Korea was so effective, and of course many countries have police powers that we just don't have here, uh, but they, they were able to quickly uh, ramp up their testing and then do the contact tracing and then enforce uh, the quarantine. Um, uh, that, that had to take place. So all of this is going to be done um, in Louisiana and elsewhere. We unfortunately were one of the largest hotspots in the country. It was about a month ago that we actually had the fastest growth in coronavirus um, COVID cases, I should say, anywhere in the world. Um, and so we're doing much, much better today, but we still have particular challenges in certain areas like Orleans and Jefferson Parish, where the case counts have been really, really high, uh, and to a lesser degree up in Caddo. But as a state, and really every single region of the state, we're doing much, much better today, Peter. Oh, well, that's good to know. So is what you're saying, and I realize you just haven't yeah. had a chance to absorb this, is what you're saying that um, we may discover that some measures and relaxations that occur in other states will not be occurring here as quickly and people yeah. will be angry at you as a consequence. Well, they, they may be angry, but, but at the same time, they'll be safer. And, and most people acknowledge that. This is not a cookie cutter approach where it's a one size fits all. And the, the, the president was very uh, careful to spell that out. Um, we, we don't like it, but the fact of the matter is we are a hotspot here. Uh, we're number three in the country in per capita cases, okay? Um, that's a huge number of cases. It's about a half percent of our population uh, right now, and you've seen the, the number of deaths, uh, which, which today at 1,156 is, is what we're reporting. But on the good side of that, we're number one per capita in testing. We still haven't tested as, as many people as we would like, and not as many as we're going to have to be able to test going forward. Um, but it, but we are going to do some things differently on a different timeline uh, than other states, and, and that's just the fact of the matter is, and, and any other approach would be irresponsible. Just, just to follow up on that, to the extent that we're going to see the country as having different rates of, of um, removal of restrictions mm -hmm. and all that, do you see the state and its parishes being treated differently based on their infection rates. Yeah, but, but perhaps not because I choose to do it that way, but you have local officials who have the authority 
Uh, so, for example, uh, I know that the mayor of New Orleans has already decided uh, that her order uh, for shelter at home will remain in place until May the 16th. By the way, I support that order because that is she, or Orleans Parish is absolutely one of the hot spots in the country. Uh, and and w with the number of cases there, the amount of cor novel coronavirus and COVID-19 that has permeated that community. And this is a high density population area, uh, relatively speaking, for our state. Uh, and the impact that it's had on the healthcare facilities, which are concentrated in New Orleans, but serve the entire region of the state. I think that that's appropriate to give a couple of more weeks uh, so that they can have a, uh, a more orderly transition to something that looks different. Um, and so that may, it may be the case that uh, Orleans Parish is, is waiting until May the 16th to be able to do some things that happen elsewhere in the state earlier, such as May the 1st. Uh, but we're still working with my team to figure out where we are on these guidelines because there are certain threshold um, uh, requirements that, that the White House Coronavirus Task Force says we should meet before we even start the phased approach of reo reopening our economy. And as we look at those, we took the first look at those threshold requirements, um, and, and I say requirements, these are all guidelines, but, but uh, quite frankly, we don't meet some of them today, but by May the 1st, we could meet all of them. Uh, and, and so, so we're going to be purposeful about this. We're going to be deliberate about it. And I'm, and I'm not going to be able to answer, uh, questions with the specificity that I would like and that you would like and the, the people would like, uh, for, for several more days, but, but understand we're going to, we're going to move forward as fast as we can do so and, and maintain the appropriate balance with respect to protecting public health. Okay, well, I appreciate it. Well, let's get to the questions submitted by readers. And, and this is our third um, virtual town hall, and, and we had one with Representative Scalise and Senator Cassidy. And yeah. what was true of those is true of this, which is um, impressive, is the questions are, are generally very respectful, and um, <laughs> they're detailed, yeah. and some of them are a little frustrated. Yeah. But um, uh, one thing that maybe this has done is to kind of improve our civic dialogue in Louisiana. Sure. Um, just the threat of it has caused that to happen. So some of these questions are now a little bit obsolete because, uh, because of today's announcement. Um, but, uh, but let me start out with, um, this is from uh, Jennifer in New Orleans. Um, if someone was receiving unemployment benefits before the pandemic, I guess, in other words, if you were unemployed on March 1st, mm -hmm. Um, do you get the six hundred dollars? Yeah. Uh, well, there's there. We have people who are manning the phones and and so forth to talk specifically, and and I'm not sure that I can give a concrete answer just on the basis of that question. Okay. Um, but but it would be. It's my understanding that if you qualify for a single dollar mm -hmm. uh, in unemployment benefits from the state. Uh, that you then can can uh, qualify for the pandemic unemployment uh, assistance uh, and and for the expanded six hundred dollars, uh, but there are always limitations, and I don't know whether one of those limitations would apply to this yeah. individual or not. Um, but with respect to unemployment, this is what I want people to understand, uh, and I'm not making excuses, but but we are having a volume of people filing initial claims and recertifications, which they have to do weekly which we have never seen in Louisiana, and, and this is happening in every state. Uh, so I'm asking them to be patient, to do what they can online and between 10 p.m. Uh, at night and, and 5 o'clock in the morning when they're going to have an easier time uh, getting through. And I do want people to know that Louisiana uh, started this week making those $600 payments, and we're one of only two states in the nation that were able to, to do that that quickly because the money uh, for, the, for the payments just came in last week. Uh, but I but I am asking people to be patient, uh, to call in if they've got questions, to follow online if they possibly can. Uh, but I, I would hate to give a definitive answer on the basis of that question and turn out that it, and it turns out that because of some limitation that this individual was ineligible. Okay, this is from Brad in New Orleans. I think I know who this is. Um, to address long-term health care capacity, why can't Charity Hospital be reopened and redeveloped back into a hospital? Well, well, first of all, um, that, that's a great question because we had two imperatives of the first order 
uh, when, when this crisis uh, broke out. One was to slow the spread. The second was to surge our medical capacity. Um, and when you surge capacity, uh, there are all sorts of constraints on your ability to do that. Um, with respect to uh, the hospital, it would be an extremely expensive uh, thing to do uh, because it's been sitting there idle. Uh, you have mechanical systems and so forth that, that you have to be able to put back into operation. Um, and, and when we met with our uh, hospital CEOs, uh, whether it's LCMC, Greg Fern, uh, Warner Thomas at Oxner and so forth, um, they felt that the, the better course would be to uh, surge their capacity within the footprint of their existing facilities, and there are a number of facilities, and they have already brought um, hundreds of ICU beds online across their systems uh, in, in New Orleans, for example, uh, and, and that, that was the better uh, course of action uh, because, Peter, it's not just about the space. The harder part of that is to find the surge staffing. So when you create a hospital outside of an existing footprint, it becomes exponentially harder to find the doctors and the nurses and the, the, the lab assistants and the respiratory therapists and all of the people that are necessary to do the staffing because, quite frankly, we only have so many doctors and nurses. And so we, we, we did what we did uh, in existing footprint. And then the easiest place uh, and, and the quickest, because it's not about just what's easy, because we had the surge within a certain timeline, was we set up a medical monitoring station at the Morial Convention Center, uh, which was easier to do uh, to create substantial capacity. And it was also easier from a staffing uh, perspective as well. Uh, and that was fully coordinated with all the hospitals in the region, especially the larger ones right there uh, in New Orleans. And so, but it's, it's a great question, but it is not, it's not as easy as you might think to go back in and just stand back up uh, the charity, charity hospital. hospital. Yeah, no, I, I expected that was what you were gonna say. Um, this is from uh, Trinette in Marrero. Um, how are landlords supposed to make ends meet when tenants quit paying rent and there's nothing landlords can do? Yeah, um, and, and look, I understand that, that that's, that's a tough situation and, and the, the landlords of, of apartment complexes and so forth, um, you know, this is obviously a, a difficult time for them. And one of the things that, that, that we've done, in fact, I've personally done it, uh, when I communicate is I say, look, your obligation to pay rent continues. Uh, we can't have from a public health perspective evictions so that people become homeless when you're fighting a pandemic because it just makes it that much harder uh, to keep it under control and to slow the spread and, and make sure that people uh, stay healthy. But the obligation to pay rent continues. And for all of those individuals who can pay rent, they should. And certainly now that the assistance is forthcoming for many more people, whether it's unemployment assistance, whether it's the stimulus check that, that started arriving, I think this week uh, in people's, at least my wife told me something got deposited <laughs> into our bank account. I don't know what it was, but, but, it, uh, but stimulus checks are, are arriving. And, and so I am encouraging people uh, to meet their obligations and, and to pay their rent. Um, and, and I know that this visits a hardship on landlords and, and I hate it. You know, Everything you do, you're trying to balance, uh, strike the right balance between competing interests. And, and you have to fight the public health emergency and take it seriously. And that means you cannot be having people uh, evicted onto the street when they can't pay, especially when you know many people are going to be unemployed and, and unable to pay. Uh, and so it, it's really difficult. I would hope that, that the, uh, the landlords uh, are out there because they run small businesses, that they're taking advantage of opportunities that they have through the Small Business Administration Paycheck Protection Program if they qualify, uh, which can be a forgivable loan um, uh, un under certain circumstances. Uh, and there's also assistance available uh, through the state uh, program of a, of a loan guarantee program that, that we unveiled a couple of weeks ago. But it, I know it's a tough situation. My answer probably doesn't uh, satisfy the questioner. Uh, I'm mindful of it. It's, it's just there's, there's just not much we can do at the present. Right, this is from James in New Orleans. Um, Orleans and Jefferson parishes have a COVID-19 infection rate that's 10x the national average. Why is that? Well, I would be guessing, and, and I'm going to offer a guess, but I'm just going to make sure people understand that, that this, this is a guess um, on my part. Uh, if, you, if you look at um, the, the concentration of so much 
COVID-19 in Orleans and Jefferson Parish, and you go back and look at when the first positive case was confirmed through through a test, uh, that was 13 days after Fat Tuesday, after Mardi Gras. We know that about a million and a half visitors uh, came uh, to the New Orleans and Jefferson Parish area uh, in the week or 10 days prior to uh, Mardi Gras, uh, Fat Tuesday. Uh, and, and I can only assume that, that, that uh, some of those people brought in the coronavirus and seeded it throughout that community. Uh, and, and there's not, uh, if you just think about uh, all the things we're trying to avoid right now, and that is crowds. Uh, and, and you want people to have good hygiene and so forth. Well, Mardi Gras is not uh, a, a very good setting for that to happen. But, but Peter, I, I would also tell you that there's a second theory out there, and there's a lot of people in New Orleans and Jefferson Parish who leave during Mardi Gras. They go to uh, Colorado to go skiing. They go to New York. They go to Disney World. Um, and they, they went out and potentially uh, contracted the virus where they were and then brought it home and continued to spread it as well. Uh, now, these are theories right now because we certainly don't know, uh, but, but I would have no problem if, if there was some sort of a study that seemed to validate the theory. I would accept it as, as true. I do want to offer this, this statement because this has been brought up and you didn't, it wasn't part of your question. At no time uh, prior to Mardi Gras uh, did any official uh, doctor, scientist, government official, the federal level or otherwise, suggest uh, that that Mardi Gras be canceled. And in fact, if you look, um, the uh, Super Bowl was held uh, just prior to that. Um, we had tens of thousands of people that went to Kobe Bryant's uh, memorial service um, that that wasn't canceled, and and so forth. And, and the word at the time well, coming out of the federal government, the CDC, what the, was the risk to the American people was low. Um, and, and it wasn't until uh, sometime after that that there was the first inclination uh, uh, or first idea uh, given by people that we should be canceling events. Okay. Um, this is from uh, Patricia of New Orleans, um, and there are a lot of questions like this. I've tried dozens of times at different hours of the day to file for unemployment. Mm -hmm. Either the website is paralyzed by the number of people filing or there's some sort of glitch. I've submitted questions to the site via email and have not received a response. Meanwhile, I'm unable to pay my bills for the next month. Mm -hmm. Yeah, gets back to one of the questions I answered before. Mm -hmm. uh, we have expanded uh, the number of people who are working. Mm -hmm. The hours that, that they, are, they are working, uh, we've expanded the, the number I'm sorry, the volume of calls that we can take and the volume of traffic that we can accommodate on uh, the website. Uh, having done all of that, it still can be very frustrating. And I apologize to, to everyone. I'm just going to ask them to be patient, be persistent, to continue to try. Whatever you can do online, um, do it online and do it between 10 p.m. Uh, and 5 a.m. When, when, uh, when the amount of people who are trying to access the system is the smallest. Uh, and, and then we, we do need people to not just submit their initial claim, but also their weekly recertifications because that's, that's uh, uh, required by law, by federal law, for them to continue to receive the payments. Um, and we're going to continue to make changes that, that improve the system. Uh, we are not outliers, as, as you might can imagine. This is happening uh, in every single state, and I don't offer that as an excuse. But this is a volume of claims that, that we have never seen before um, by a, a factor of, of several times. Uh, and so we are ramping up uh, all, all of our capacity uh, to handle these claims, but we're not, but we're not there yet. Um, and so I'm just asking for people to be patient uh, and be persistent. And, and again, we're the second state, and we're one of two states, uh, paying the $600 right now. And so there are certain things that we're, we're, we're doing, doing well, we're doing well. And I want to thank all of the, the, the people at the Louisiana Workforce Commission for the work that they are doing. Right. I did read um, that, that you've hired, you know, up from like 25 people to like 300 people or something like that. Yeah. And, and not necessarily hired them. So, so they may have been working at the Workforce Commission already, but they were working in different areas. Oh, and and so they, they've been brought to okay. supplement uh, yeah. This particular group that, that typically handles our, our unemployment claims, uh, and and so that's that's what we've been able to do, um, and quite frankly, we're going to continue to search, and we're looking for new and, and better ways to 
to to make sure that we can take care of these claims. And and by the way, I'm also looking forward to the day when people uh, don't need these this unemployment assistance because they're back at work and our economy is flourishing again. Okay. Um, all right. This is from uh, Ben in Thibodeau. Um, uh, why can't hairdressers and barbers open by appointment only? Well, it's not so much uh, whether it's appointment or not. Uh, these are forward-facing uh, personal services uh, and, and have a, a really uh, higher risk than most of, of, uh, of spreading the virus. Um, and so when we're in our, our main effort, uh, our stay-at-home effort to fight this virus, when we're doing what we can do as a state, uh, to match the call coming from the president and the vice president, you know, that 30 days to stop the spread. Um, all of the CDC guidance specifically pointed out uh, things like tattoo parlors and beauty parlors and barber shops and nail salons as the, the types of things that we needed to close. And when, when they do reopen, there's going to be some limitations. Uh, and, and the appointment may be helpful because you're not going to want people sitting in a waiting room in close proximity to one another. Uh, they may need to temperature check people. And, and the people providing the service and the customers uh, may need to wear a mask uh, and, and so forth. These are precisely the types of people that shouldn't be uh, working while they're sick. Uh, and so if, if they're sick, we're going to ask them not to do that. Um, and, you know, I understand the hardship that this is putting on them, um, and, and we, we hope to be able to ease the restrictions as soon as possible with the, po with the necessary precautions in place. Um, and, and we're going to do that uh, as, as, as we are able and consistent with these guidelines that I'm holding in my hand that we haven't yet had an opportunity to go through. Okay. Another question. Since Lowe's and Home Depot are selling garden plants with people moving around the nursery unrestricted, why can't churches cordon off every second or third row of pews and enforce social distancing as well as control entry and exits and be allowed to resume Sunday services? Well, I'm looking forward to, to being able, just like we're talking about the, the salons and, and, and so forth, I'm looking forward to being able to ease the restrictions uh, on, on the size of, of, of crowds that can be in, in a particular venue. Um, and we're looking for ways to do that where, where it can be safe. What, what we know is that, uh, quite frankly, there is not a setting uh, more conducive to the spread of the coronavirus and, and COVID-19 uh, than your, your typical um, uh, worship service uh, where you have many people sitting in close proximity for an hour, hour and a half, two hours at a time, um, and, and, and you have many members uh, who are older and in the vulnerable population because of chronic health conditions and so forth. Uh, and so as, as, we, as we knew that we had to battle this like a war uh, and, and stop the spread and flatten the curve, um, quite frankly, it just, it just wasn't uh, an option to leave, uh, to exempt um, uh, houses of worship. That is not an easy decision to make. I mean, that, that's, that's very tough. It was very tough uh, for me, someone who, who, who you know, I'm, I'm certainly a Christian, a Catholic Christian, and I, I go to Mass, and I think it's, it's critically important. But at the same time, um, we, we needed to do what was necessary uh, to protect public health and get through this emergency. Uh, we are going to be, just as we're going to be making changes with respect to the way restaurants function and office buildings and, mm -hmm. and other uh, venues, we are going to be uh, easing the restrictions and, and uh, there will be more people who will be allowed to go to, to worship services uh, once we get through this. Um, and, and we're looking to see exactly what that's going to look like. But I can tell you, it is going to require the churches uh, to, to take a lot of, of uh, accountability upon themselves to ensure social distancing and to ensure that proper hygiene and that the pews get get cleaned uh, frequently and and that they're going to be asking people not to come if they're sick, that they're going to be especially messaging to parishioners that they might have uh, who are vulnerable because of their age or chronic underlying conditions and so forth. But in that initial effort that we had to make, uh, again, Peter, we had the fastest growth rate in COVID cases in the world, according to John Hopkins data. That was just a month ago. And so you have to take actions uh, that are commensurate with, with the challenges. And, and, and the, the churches were just part of that. And that's just the unfortunate reality 
wasn't something we wanted to do, and we're looking at ways as we re-engage the economy going forward. And and by the way, this is this is not now. It's not next week. It's sometime uh, after the expiration of this order that we're currently going through on, on April the 30th. I need people today uh, focused squarely on continuing to uh, abide by the stay-at-home order, maintain social distancing, wear a mask when they're out, stay home if they're sick, and engage in proper hygiene uh, measures so that we can continue to slow the spread, flatten the curve, uh, and put ourselves in a better position to, to reopen the economy. Okay, this is from uh, Kathy of Prairieville, um, says, you know, you, you continue to tell us that we should social distance and yet you allow Tony Spell and his congregation to ignore you. Mm -hmm. um, why, why, are you why are you allowing him to ignore you? Well, and, first and, of all. And the others who go to ignore yeah, you. Yeah, and, and, and look, I, I know that, that uh, he's the one that's drawing the most attention. Mm -hmm. The fact is we have well over 4,000 churches. I suspect that there are others out there as well. Mm -hmm. But he's, he's uh, unfortunately chosen not to, to be the leader that I would have hoped he would be um, because leaders, whether they come from the business community, the faith community, um, uh, whether they're elected political leaders, uh, when you have a public health emergency, we, we need leaders who are focused on health and, and the health of, of whoever it is that, that they are leading. Uh, that's not the path that he has chosen to follow. Um, but one of the things that, that you have to consider is not just the initial action that you take, but what are the second and third order effects of that? Uh, and, and, and by that, I mean, it, it was clear to me that with over 4,000 churches, tens of thousands of businesses, 4.7 million people out there, uh, we're not going to enforce our way out of this. We're just, we're just not going to do it. Uh, but secondly, you, you run the risk uh, through an enforcement measure of actually providing the individual that you're trying to enf enforce the stay-at-home order uh, on, uh, you give them a bigger platform. Uh, to use and and then to you you potentially have protesters showing up in great numbers and then you have a law enforcement problem and a public health problem and the, the and so we, we just uh, and and by the way I've supported the the efforts that the district attorney and East Baton Rouge Parish did make because uh, I know that a summons was was served uh, on on the the pastor and I want to use this form again today uh, to to urge him I'm appealing to him uh, to, to stop what he's doing because he is putting uh, his parishioners at, at a greater risk for contracting uh, this virus. Uh, we know that this virus is much more contagious than the flu. We know it is much deadlier than the flu. And, and we are in, still in a stage here in Louisiana where we're very much focused on, on flattening the curve. And, and I, I would appeal to him again uh, to, to stop what he's doing. And then if he won't, I'm going to appeal to his parishioners to stay home. Um, they, they, they have obligations as individuals, too. Uh, this is a lawful order. I have no doubt that we're in a public health emergency that was, that was declared by me. Um, uh, and, and, by the way, that was backed up by a declaration that came from President Trump as well. And that confers up, upon, uh, uh, upon me the authority to take the actions that we've taken. I have no doubt that they're legal, they're appropriate, they're necessary. Um, and, and I would encourage uh, Pastor Spell and all of his parishioners, and by the way, everybody else out there, uh, to, to do what they can to abide by these orders. Okay, this is from Kaya in New Orleans, and she says, I would like to thank you for the incredible job of keeping Louisianians informed amid this COVID-19 crisis. My question is, why is the state conducting checks of abortion clinics? I'm sorry, why is, <coughs> is the state or isn't? conducting checks of abortion clinics? Well, first of all, we, we've done checks of numerous uh, clinics of different, different types. One of the things that we needed to do when we're surging our medical capacity uh, was to, to make sure that we weren't engaging in uh, non-emergency uh, medical and surgical procedures so that you can conserve PPE that can go to the frontline healthcare providers, nurses and doctors and so forth in our hospitals. Um, we, we also knew that, that that was essential in the overall effort uh, to, to slow the spread of, of COVID-19 uh, because, because much of this is spread in, in medical settings. Uh, so we issued um, guidance, uh, or order I should say, out of the Department of Health. 
uh, to that effect. Dr. Guidry uh, did that. It wasn't just aimed at abortion clinics. It was it was aimed at, at all uh, health care providers of these types of, of services. So whether it's a, 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 you know, a surgical center, it could be an orthopedic clinic, and by the way, none of which were closed by the order, but the types of, of things that they could engage in uh, were limited. Uh, and, and so it, it wasn't something where we were just focusing on abortion clinics. Okay. Uh, this is from um, uh, Candace. I'm sorry, this is from Candace in Metairie, although I don't know why that, uh, I'm sorry, this is from Spencer in Tangipahoe Parish. The DMV in Tangipahoe Parish is closed down. I have a vehicle that needs a tag as well as license plates, and where can I go to get one? Um, well, that's a, that's a great question. Uh, I don't know the answer as I'm sitting here, mm -hmm. uh, I, and I don't know exactly how to get a hold of Spencer, uh, Spencer to get him that information. Um, but I would like very much to be able to, to send that information to him. Okay. Uh, and, and by the way, the, the uh, Office of Motor Vehicles in Tangeville Parish, that closure happened uh, before the COVID-19 uh, uh, situation. There was a problem with the building uh, that they were in. Uh, I believe that there's still uh, some, some curbside service that may be available through the Office of Motor Vehicles. Uh, and I will try to get that information to him if you can provide. I can uh, provide you all with the. You, you I can have your staff with the email. Yeah, if that. you will, yeah. I, I will. I will okay. have. I will have someone from the Office of Motor Vehicles contact Spencer uh, to get him that information. I do want to take this time though to talk about that. Even though the Office of Motor Vehicles is 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 closed uh, to the public, uh, you can uh, renew your driver's license uh, through the LA Wallet app. The app itself is free. Uh, and, and there is a, a cost, as there always is, for renewing your driver's license, uh, but the $18 convenience fee is being waived, and so you can download the app for free. You do not pay the, uh, the $18 convenience fee. You will just pay the cost that you would normally uh, incur, uh, have to pay uh, to, to, um, to renew your driver's license. Of course, I th every other time that you renew your driver's license, you have to go in and have your eyes checked. So it's not gonna be available for everybody, but there are an awful lot of people who can take advantage of this. And for the people who can't take advantage of it, um, then there's not going to be any penalty associated uh, for having a, a uh, uh, driver's license that is out of date until after 30 days Ex expires or elapses from the end of the public health emergency. So, okay. so I just want to make sure people okay. understand that. Okay. Is, is are are are, uh, are you all enforcing? You know the uh, vehicle inspections. Um, you know, is that going on? Do you know? Well, you know, I, I don't want to speak for all of law enforcement out there. I can tell you, gen generally speaking, uh, law enforcement is is not trying to do things that would bring them into contact with the public unnecessarily or bring the public into contact with them. Um, it, but we do need people to be safe. And, and I know this is not the question you just asked, but it was reported to me this morning by Colonel Reeves, the head of the state police, uh, that we've actually seen an uptick, uh, an uptick recently in the number of fatal crashes across the state of Louisiana, even though the volume of traffic it's is way down, down yeah. which suggests that people think that with fewer drivers on the road, that they, the ones who are, they can drive faster. Okay. Uh, but the, all of the rules of the road still apply. Mm -hmm. All of the traffic laws, and especially speed limits, they do still apply, and we do have law enforcement out on, on the road for those reasons. Okay, Matt of New Orleans says, will Catholic schools be able to hold scheduled graduations in mass at the end of May? I don't know the answer to that. Um, and, and if there may be some crowd, crowd limitations, that, that size limitations, uh, and it would sort of depend on the facility that they're in, how big the facility is. Um, I don't think you're gonna see uh, graduation uh, ceremonies at the end of May that would have looked like they looked in May of 2019. Um, but but I'm going to ask him to be patient because we, we're going to be issuing uh, guidance on that uh, uh, later this month um, as, the, as the current uh, proclamation executive order expires on April the 29th. It will be replaced. And by the way, you're going to have individuals uh, and entities that will also put rules on themselves. And, and so it won't just be a function of what my order does. It's going to be a function of what that particular Catholic school uh, chooses to do. Okay, this is from James of Shreveport. 
Um, why are some people getting $600 a week in their, on their unemployment checks retroactive to the week ending April 4th, and some people receive payments for only one of the weeks? Um, well, first of all, the, that is a, a function of federal law. It was in the CARES Act. Um, and I can't answer that particular question. I can tell you it's retroactive to as far back as the week ending April the 4th, provided that the individual during that week qualified for uh, that unemployment benefit. If, if the individual wasn't uh, unemployed until the following week, then he or she may only apply, uh, qualify uh, for one week's of the $600. Uh, so everybody's situation uh, is different. Uh, and, and it's hard for me to give blanket responses right now, um, but, but as a general matter, uh, the $600 a week is retroactive as far back as the week ending April the 4th. Those who qualify for it can get it. And by the way, um, it wasn't possible in some situations uh, to issue a check with $1,200 worth of benefits. That doesn't mean that the second $600 isn't going to show up. And so, so uh, it, it could be, and I hope for the benefit of this individual who asked the question, is that there will be another check coming with $600 in it to, to make that, that benefit fully retroactive for both of those weeks. But I don't know if he qualified for the first week or not, and so I can't guarantee that. Okay. This is a theme in a lot of the questions. Um, were you surprised when the, the reviews of the data revealed the the racial discrepancies in the in the death rates you may have been briefed earlier so you may yeah. have understood it earlier yeah well the answer is yes um and i i was uh, surprised and disappointed uh, i know it's something that we we're, we're having to take a look at both in the short term uh, so that we're more effectively communicating with these individuals who who are especially vulnerable uh, to this disease and then also so that so that uh, over time uh, we can reduce these disparities so that so that uh, when this happens again hopefully it never happens again uh, but whether it does or, or doesn't we want people to be as healthy as possible so I was surprised that African Americans are dying at, at twice their percentage you know so in the state's population they're about 33 mm. percent they're they're over 60 percent uh, of the deaths in our state now i've always known uh that they they have more of the comorbidities um uh on average mm. and in any in, in african-american community is what i'm trying to say and so i I'm, i would not have been surprised disappointed yes but not surprised had we seen that more than 33 percent of of the the deaths were in african americans but the fact that it's over 60 percent that really did surprise me um and what i've learned since we were the first state to report on that by the way here in louisiana mm -hmm. what i've learned since then is there are other places where where the same thing is showing up mm -hmm. milwaukee and detroit and, and and in other places so we have a lot of work to do that's why we created a task force to really study this and and try to better communicate. Uh, and, and by the way, it's not too late for individuals, whether they're African American or not. We know that you're more vulnerable if you have hypertension, diabetes, kidney disease, heart disease. Well, don't just accept that, because right now you can do things that that, that make you healthier, even though you have these comorbidities. Take your medicine. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, watch your sugar intake. Watch your salt intake. Uh, do what you can uh, in order to be as healthy as possible despite the fact that you have this condition so that in the unfortunate event that you do contract this disease, you're in a better position uh, to, to fight it off. Incredibly important that people do that. One of the things that uh, Senator Cassidy said when I visited with him last week was that uh, it may be that the reentry to work and, and those kinds of things would be structured in a way that favored younger people or people who don't have those health conditions. And, um, and I thought at the time that um, people who are older and do have those health conditions might not like that idea yeah. and might be worried about being, you know, displaced in a recessionary economy mm -hmm. when, you know, I'm not allowed to return to work, but they let a younger fellow return to work and then eventually they figure out they can get by like that. Um, do you think that uh, that idea has any any practical application? Well, y you know, it's not something that I thought about uh, until you just uh, asked the question, and I don't know that that's going to play out. Uh, we do know uh, 
or, or we expect uh, that antibody testing is going to inform uh, a lot of the decisions uh, that are made. Uh, and and uh, a big percentage of young people who've had the disease had relatively few, if any, complications from it. Some, some may have rain, remained completely asymptomatic throughout or had mild symptoms, but yet they developed the antibodies needed to confer some immunity on them. So, so they're going to have a, a, a better ability uh, to resume uh, work and, and other activities. Um, but I can tell you this, it's very clear in this Opening Up America Again guidelines that came out today from, from the White House uh, that they were asking us to always do things to, to take special care uh, with respect to those individuals who are most vulnerable by age or by chronic health condition. Um, I, I do hope that it doesn't mean that people can't go back to work, but I can tell you this, if you're over 65 uh, and employed or you've got these chronic health conditions, it is much uh, better if you can work from home that you do that. And if you do have to go to work, you've got to make sure that you're pro following social distancing, uh, wearing the mask, asking people in close proximity to you wear the mask and, and make sure that you're following the hygiene practices. Okay, um, this is from uh, Mike in Woodworth. Um, do you know, I'm sorry, it's from Karen in Metairie. Do you know how long the travel restrictions will be in place in Texas and when, the, when those uh, checkpoints will be removed? Uh, no, I, I can't tell you that I know that because it's not something that, that I'm in control over. Um, and I don't know, I guess you could characterize them as travel restrictions. Uh, it's, it's my understanding that no one has is, is said that you can't travel into Texas at those checkpoints. Uh, but if, you're, if your destination is in Texas, um, they're telling you that they expect you to quarantine there for, for 14 days before you go out uh, and about. And if you're just traveling through Texas, you're allowed uh, to do that. And there are some essential uh, services and infrastructure and workers and so forth that are not being uh, placed on, on the, the quarantine uh, program either with, with respect to the 14 days. Uh, the last I checked, um, the way this was working was that they were on the major uh, routes into Texas, uh, and such as Interstate 10, Interstate 20, pulling over somewhere between five and 10 cars at a time, regardless of what states they were coming from, by the way, not just from Louisiana. Uh, and, and while they're talking to those particular drivers, uh, then, then all the rest of the traffic is, is just flowing through as normal. Uh, and then, and then they'll go back out and pull six to 10 more over or something like that. But, but commercial vehicles are not, are not being stopped at all. Yeah. We sent, um, Brooks Cabina, um, actually went over there to see what was actually from Houston, mm -hmm. went over there to see, and that was kind of what his experience yeah, was. And yeah. And I think that's still the way they're doing it. So, so I think it's probably fair to call it a travel restriction but there is no real restriction from people going to Florida, uh, but, but there is an expectation that you're going to quarantine if you're going to go there to, to stay. Okay. Katie of New Orleans says, if the Louisiana Senate and House do not vote to accept the Secretary of State's emergency election plan, can the governor use his emergency authority, that's you, use his emergency authority? Well, we've used the emergency authority that I have to reset the election dates and, and to... Uh, which which now going to be on July the 11th for the primary, August the 15th for the general election, right. and then to change um, um, qualifying periods is, as well. Um, quite frankly, uh, I don't believe that I have the authority under the law to go beyond that, uh, and and we we needed the legislature to approve the plan that that the uh, secretary of state came up with. As a general matter, I will just tell you, no one should have to decide. Uh, whether they're going to expose themselves or to others uh, to the risk of contracting uh, uh, COVID-19 in order to uh, exercise their right to vote. Uh, and so it's my hope, my expectation that the legislature uh, will work with the Secretary of State and if, and, and if they want some modification of his plan, uh, that that will happen soon. Uh, but people should not be asked to, to engage in that sort of a decision uh, when it comes to, to casting a, a vote. We don't want uh, what happened recently uh, in Wisconsin to happen in Louisiana. Uh, and what I can tell you is in July and August, there will be the novel coronavirus in Louisiana. There will be COVID-19 in Louisiana. We won't yet have a vaccine. I don't know whether there'll be an effective thera 
therapeutic treatment or not, but we're not going to be fully back to normal. Uh, and quite frankly, we shouldn't be having an election as if everything is normal. So I hope that, that the legislature will, will get on board, uh, work with the Secretary of State, who's doing the best that he can uh, in order to, to make sure that we have uh, uh, an election that, that preserves public health while grants access to the ballot box to, to our voters. Okay. This is from Karen in Baton Rouge, and she asks if our COVID-19 patients being administered hydrochloroquine, yeah. And if so, what's the magnitude of it and what's the success of it? Yeah, and, and it? I, can't, I can't speak to the success of it now. Um, I can tell you that, that I've known for many weeks now um, that hospitals have a certain protocol, and, and there are certain uh, patients where it's contraindicated, and, and they, they're not going to administer it. Um, and I'm not going to pretend to be a physician here. Uh, but, but the hydroxychloroquine, uh, which goes by the name of Plaquenil, uh, is being administered in many of our hospitals to many of their patients uh, with COVID-19, sometimes in combination with other drugs such as um, the z pack the azithromycin um, uh, medicine that, that you can get, and then sometimes in a, in a triple uh, uh, cocktail I as well. Uh, I can't speak to the efficacy of it, um, and and uh, but but we do know that it was being prescribed, uh, and early on uh, it was being prescribed and used in in such numbers that it exceeded the supply that is on hand that's necessary for lupus patients and patients with rheumatoid arthritis and and so forth, and and so the the efforts to greatly increase the amount of the drug that's in the state uh, has been helpful um, because it's my understanding that the uh, Board of Pharmacy was able to rescind their emergency rule on this because the supply uh, w was replenished uh, to a sufficient degree, uh, and then they just issued some guidance about the prescription uh, for it. But it is being used. I, I'm I'm not able to say today what the efficacy of it is, uh, but but uh, I know that uh, that many hospitals and doctors around the state of Louisiana have made that part of the treatment protocol. It, it remains the case, uh, at least as far as I know it, and things are changing every day, there is not yet what they call a therapeutic intervention for COVID-19, and that means there is there is not a, an approved treatment for it. And, and so everything that they're doing is, is somewhat um, of, of a trial, uh, and, it, and it's not proven, um, but, but, you know, we'll, we'll see. Okay. This is from uh, Ryan of Thibodeau, and this is – Another thematic question that's come up a few times, um, are we labeling as coronavirus deaths people who die of other causes? Yeah. Well, that's in, in the death numbers that we're reporting. So for today, it's 1,156 deaths. Mm -hmm. I can tell you that all 1,156 of those individuals uh, had a, a test result that was positive for COVID-19. Mm -hmm. Uh, there's a much greater likelihood that there are individuals who are dying and, and they, they're not being tested uh, and potentially died of a complication related to COVID-19, um, but, but it's not showing up uh, that way because a, a test wasn't administered. Uh, so, you know, I, I don't believe that, that, that what he was questioning about is happening. I know it's not happening with respect to the reports that we are issuing. And by the way, that's why sometimes uh, we're reporting a number of deaths, uh, only a fraction of which happened in the previous uh, day or two or three. Sometimes they suspend it back as, as far as 10 days because we're waiting for the test result mm -hmm. to catch up uh, and be reflected on the death certificate. Okay. Uh, this is from uh, Dolores of Shreveport. Um, she says, can I, a 55-year-old black female, get tested for coronavirus for free? Yes. Um, but when she is symptomatic, right now they're not issuing uh, tests uh, to asymptomatic people because the result is not reliable, and you can give someone a false negative, and they believe that they don't have it, um, but they, they do. Uh, they just haven't become symptomatic, and they haven't started shedding enough virus to where the test result came up positive, and you give them this false sense of confidence that they can go out and continue to, to work or whatever. And so you have to be symptomatic. But in the CARES Act, um, it, was, it was specifically approved by Congress uh, and, and signed into law by the president uh, that no one has to pay. And, and so if you're uninsured, 
uh, then they, they have other ways of paying for that test. And there should not be a copayment mm -hmm. or anything uh, for these individuals. Yeah. Okay, well, those were great questions, but um, now we've got some stumpers from Smiley uh, Anders. Uh-oh, here we um, go. And uh, as I said at the beginning, you know, Smiley Anders, who's one of the few people at The Advocate who's older than me, um, <laughs> is um, uh, there are some people who believe that Smiley actually covered um, the 1918 pandemic, but he would have to be 120 to do that. <laughs> so he might look 120, but I don't think he is 120. Did you grow up reading Smiley? Anders? I did. Okay. So, so all, the, the entire time at, at my house, uh, we always subscribed to The Advocate. Um, and one of my jobs as one of the youngest in my household was to make sure that my dad had that paper in the morning. Uh, and and so we, we went out into the uh, front of the driveway, got the paper, brought it to him, and and I and I I suspect Smiley has been in that paper the entire time I've been reading it. Oh, that's probably that's probably true. So here's here are Smiley's questions. These these are serious matters. It says Governor, has the unsettled situation due to the virus put any extra stress on your chickens at the governor's <laughs> mansion? And if so, has it affected their taste? Well, first of all, I don't eat my chickens. Uh, the, the eggs <laughs> taste just fine. I don't believe it has anything to do with the virus, but but we've had a, a black fly, fly problem and a gnat problem uh, all along the river in, in Louisiana. And quite frankly, I've lost a few chickens because oh. because they, they, they will suffocate. Uh, uh, and so we, we're trying to make sure that we can we can take care of that and uh, we're trying something today uh, by mixing water and vanilla extract, spraying it on the mosquitoes and seeing if that keeps the flies away. Um, but the the eggs that I am getting taste just fine, uh, and I'm, I'm actually going to replenish my stock. I've got a few uh, young hens that, that I'm going to buy and put in there with them. Uh, but I appreciate him asking about my chickens, and it just so happens uh, we're having some problems right now. But it doesn't have anything to do with, with the, the virus. <laughs> okay. Well, I know that they had a, um, I think a tiger in New York was uh, was found to have coronavirus. Is that right? Yeah, and so we, we get a lot of questions about people about, you know, whether their pets can get coronavirus and all that. And I, I refer all those questions to okay. Mike Strain okay. because he's a okay. veterinarian and the commissioner okay. of agriculture and forestry. And by the way, that is something that he's keeping up with. Okay. Well, you know, they put a fence around Mike the tiger. I, I don't know if you knew that. Mm -hmm. um, so now you have... You have a glass that protects Mike the Tiger, protects us from Mike the Tiger, and we have a fence that protects Mike the Tiger from us. Yeah. Well, look, that's that's sort of the thing behind the mask. The CDC recommends masks now. And, Peter, if you wear a mask, you're protecting others from yourself. Mm -hmm. um, and then it's always helpful to look out and see that they're being uh, as courteous as you are and, and protecting uh, you from them by, by wearing a mask as well. Okay. Well, so this is Smiley's. This is the last question. So Smiley says, Governor, has there been any concern about Mike the Tiger catching the virus? In addition to the measures already taken, should he wear a mask? And if he should wear a mask, which Republican would you appoint to put it on him? <laughs> well, first of all, uh, I would hope that we're making sure that that, uh, that no Alabama uh, fan is getting close to Mike the Tiger uh, <laughs> right now uh, because they, they might intentionally try to see whether they could give uh, our Tiger uh, COVID-19. And, uh, no, that that is a very funny uh, uh, story and and uh, or question I, I should say. Um, in, in all seriousness, I do I do hope that uh, this fall uh, the LSU Tigers are going to be able to uh, defend and successfully uh, their title. I suspect they will be able to do that. Don't know what the games are going to look like in terms of the crowds and and all that sort of stuff. But uh, but in the meantime, uh, I hope that other. LSU fans in, in the state and out of state are doing what I'm doing, and that is when I do find myself at home late at night and I've got some spare time, I'm watching uh, the games that I tape. I taped every single game last year. Oh, did you? Uh, I have, okay. and, and, I, and I've, I've watched them all more than once now, mm -hmm. and, uh, and I find that to be extremely entertaining. It excites me. Uh, it's one of the reasons that I'm really hoping we can get past this coronavirus uh, sooner than later and, and get back to enough normalcy that we can be in Tiger Stadium watching them beat Alabama in Baton Rouge this year. Okay. Well, the good thing with watching those games is it doesn't matter which one of the 15 you put on. You know how it's going to end. <laughs> and we're never okay. going to trail in the fourth quarter, and we're going to win the game. Yeah. Well, there you go. Well, we appreciate you coming by. You know, you've always been a great explainer, and, uh, and we appreciate that. Um, and we thank everyone for joining us. Um, you know, journalism has never been more important to Louisiana at this moment. 
And, uh, and if you want to support us and support journalism, we ask you to go to nola.com slash subscribe. And a, uh, a digital subscription only costs $2.32 a week. Um, and you can also uh, get the print edition, which I think probably is what you grew up with. It and, is. Uh, Smiley is in there six days a week. <laughs> uh, he's, and he still is. Anyhow, thank you all for watching. and Thank, thank you, you, Peter. Guys. Appreciate okay. you.